Okay, so here we are uh, looking at uh, lecture four uh, on Heidegger's origin of work of art. And last lecture, we ended with this discussion of truth and how truth is set to work uh, in a work of art. And we were looking at the, in particular, this work by uh, Van Gogh, the, uh, the peasant shoes, at least uh, Heidegger is seeing them as peasant shoes. The title of the work is just a pair of shoes. And in fact, they're, uh, uh, I think they're actually Van Gogh's shoes. We'll talk actually a little bit about that later. Some, some uh, other philosophers have raised objections to Heidegger in, in this regard, but that, that's something for a, a, later, a later video. Okay, but to, again, towards the end of the, the last video, we were just barely getting into, just kind of scratching the surface about this notion of truth as aletheia, right? As a sort of um, openness, uh, sorry, uh, disclosedness or unconcealedness. And we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit more about truth in the work of art in this video. But in this lecture, this is going to be a bit of, it's going to seem like a bit of a digression, but he's, he's, there's a bit of a turning point here in the essay. And he's kind of uh, making some pre uh, preparatory remarks. Uh, but we're also going to look at some other works of art, namely a poem, uh, to kind of get at some one of his his, his argument that that we, um, or you might even not even call it an argument, uh, his sort of insistence, his emphatic insistence that uh, art is not simply a reproduction of something. In other words, it's not, you know, this Greek notion of art as imitation, right? Uh, uh, the imitative arts are what we're talking about when we talk about art in general. You know, for the ancient Greeks, they, they, they use the term techne to denote both craft, you know, a skill like being a blacksmith and being a painter. Those are both types of techne. But the painter, his techne was a techne of imitation. It was an imitative art. So he... You know, whereas the carpenter would actually make a table, the painter would paint a picture of the table. Uh, and for Plato, you know, for him, that made the painter somehow deficient, uh, not as good as the, as the actual carpenter. Okay, so Heidegger says, no, art is not a reproduction in that sense. It's not just a copy of something actual in the world, and, and he rejects that, okay? Doesn't really provide much of an argument for that. He's gonna give us an example of a work of art, you know, a, a poem here, to sort of give us an idea of where he's coming from, and, and, and I guess provide a bit of an argument. Uh, and, then, and then we're not gonna have time for it in this video. We'll probably have to save it for the very beginning of the next lecture. Uh, he's going to give us an example of the Greek temple. And how the Greek temple certainly doesn't represent anything else. It just is a temple, but it is a work of architecture. It's a work of art. And it's also a way in which truth is set to work in the work of art. And he's going to try and talk about that. But that's for the next video, right? Again, this video is a lot of its kind of preparatory uh, remarks, but we've got a lot to cover. So let's just dive right in here. Uh, we've already gone over this quote. Um, again, this is sort of his his take on uh, representational art and, and not exactly, you know, squaring with that, right? Art is not just a reproduction of something in the world. Um, and so he says, and if, and if in the case of this hymn and similar poems, the idea of a copy relation between something already actual and the artwork clearly fails, the view that the work is a copy is confirmed in the best possible way by a work of the kind presented in C.F. Meyer's poem, Roman Fountain. So he says, you know, look at this poem. The, obviously this poem is not a copy of, you know, something in the world. It's much more than that. It's not just some copy of a poem, or sorry, a copy of a fountain, you know, a, a, a representation of a fountain. So let's read the poem real quick, and then we'll see sort of his, his what he says afterwards. So again, this is a C.F. Meyer poem, The Roman Fountain. The jet ascends and falling fills, the marble basin circling round. The veiling itself over spills into a second basin's ground. The second in such plenty lives, its bubbling flood a third invests, and each at once receives and gives, and streams and rests. So he says, you know, um, that this is not a poetic painting of a fountain. 
right? We're not, it's not just giving you a description of a fountain, you know, a detailed description of a fountain that's actually present or, or even a reproduction, as he puts it, of a general essence of a Roman fountain. Yet, as he puts it, truth is put into the work. What truth is happening in the work? He doesn't really answer this. That, that is kind of um, odd. He, he gives us an example of the Roman fountain and just sort of, I, I guess he's assuming that we're supposed to read it and, and kind of understand the truth. Obviously, a fountain is <laughs> of these different levels, right? A jet always ascends. There's a marble basin circling around. There's a veiling over itself, all these other uh, levels that are, you know, veiling over each other into the second basin's ground, right? Spills, right? You, we can look at this metaphorically, right? You see this, oh, is this, is this sort of like a, I don't know, there's so many different interpretations you can make of this poem. You can just take it at face value as a description of this process of overflowing and streaming downwards uh, and sort of noticing, you know, the truth of the object itself of all of what the fountain does. Uh, you can see this metaphorically. I, I was just thinking earlier today about maybe this could be, I don't know if I like this, but it could be like a, 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 a an interpretation or a, a, a allegory for Reaganomics, you know, tr tr trickle down economics, you know, when, when the, the, the few at the top get rich and bountiful, then the rest will fall down or whatever. But nevertheless, it sets to truth into work as, as a, there's a happening of truth in the work whether it's the truth of or, or 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 me just thinking about this fact of reaganomics and trickle down economics and whether or not it's true or not that's a fact of the world that i'm contemplating whether i'm contemplating the structure of roman fountains okay um he asked this question well can truth happen at all right is truth something that happens we don't normally think of truth in this way Again, I, I mentioned earlier, we're not going to get too much into this notion of truth in this video. A lot of this is preparatory remarks. He's going to come back to this notion of truth as Alathea towards the end of the essay. And it's going to be quite central to his, his, his uh, I think, his overall thesis here. Um, but anyways, he's asking this question, can it be a happening, right? Can truth happen and, and thus be somehow a historical truth, right? People say that it's timeless and super temporal, right? That's at least a kind of a philosophical way of putting it. Truth is eternal. You know, truth doesn't change. You know, think about mathematical truths. Two plus two is four is always true, you know, no matter what day of the week it is. It's not a historical truth. It's timeless. Um, so he's, he's going to kind of leave that question hanging, okay? But we were, we were talking in the last lecture about um, the nature of equipment. And he saw, we saw how, you know, as he puts it, a work was able to tell us what equipment is. We, you know, in, if you didn't watch the last video, you're not going to get this. But he uses the painting of Van Gogh, he argues, to reveal what equipment is, in, in, in particular a piece of shoes or right, a pair of shoes uh you know he's going to say the peasant shoes and by reflecting on the painting we were allowed to get to the equipmental being of the shoes to use sort of heidegger speak again if you're not following this you obviously didn't watch the last video or you just didn't follow it so rewatch it or whatever uh because i'm not going to go over it again uh in this video right we've got too much other stuff to cover Okay, but any, anyway, so again, let me start the quote over. So we allowed a work to tell us what equipment is. Right? We saw that in the last video. By, by this means, almost clandestinely, it came to light what is at work in the work. The disclosure of the particular being in its being. Okay, so in this sort of clandestine way, this sort of roundabout way, you know, in the midst of trying to figure out what it means to be equipment and using this painting of Van Gogh to help us as a guide, it came to light what is at work in the work. In this case, the particular work of art, Van Gogh. And what is at work in the work? As Heidegger puts it, the disclosure of a particular being in its being, right? A pair of shoes in its being, right? You know, what the shoes really are. At, you know, the, you know we, we, when we use the shoes, we don't even notice we're wearing them, right? Because they are so effective 
they have this reliability that makes them sort of uh, invisible to us, even though we're aware of them. If we were, you know, if we were pressed to tell, you know, are you wearing shoes? Yeah, duh, and I know I am, but we're not thinking about it. We don't give it a thought, it recedes. But the work of art is able to disclose that being to us. And in this sense, Heidegger says, it's the happening of truth, that the work itself, the art, when it does this, is the happening of truth. If, however, the reality of the work can be defined solely by means of what is at work in the work, then what about our intention to seek out the real artwork and its reality? As long as we supposed that the reality of the work lay primarily in its thingly substructure, we were going astray. So Heidegger feels like he's come to this insight at this moment. He's thinking, okay, now, What's going on here? We looked at this work of art, and it seemed like what it did when it worked, <clears throat> when, when, when the, the piece of art, artwork was doing its work, it was letting truth happen. It was, let, it was re revealing to us the happening of the truth, the being of the being of these shoes in this particular case. Okay? So that was what was going on there. And so... If that's the case, if that's what art works do, if that's what the work of the work consists in, then we've been kind of going the wrong way, trying to find the nature or the reality of the work by trying to uncover its thingly substructure, as he puts it here. Right. So far, he's been going over all these different interpretations of the thing, what it means to be a thing, and he ends up finally kind of settling in on the third interpretation uh, as a sort of starting point. But the third interpretation, you know, again, if you're not following me, you don't know what I'm talking about, you didn't watch the earlier videos, go review, okay? I'm not going to go over it again. The third interpretation, right, the sort of matter and form together, um, you know, for him, this reveals to us the sort of essential framework or essence of equipment, okay? But it kind of leads us astray and really looking for the thing, the sort of what makes the thing a thing, leads us somewhat astray when we're trying to uncover the work, the, what makes a work a work. What is the workly character of the work, as Heidegger puts it. So we're now confronted by a remarkable result of our considerations, if it still deserves to be called a result at all. Two points become clear. First, the dominant thing concepts are inadequate at means of grasping the thingly aspect of the work, right? Go review the earlier videos if you're not following what he's talking about here, right? He went over three different interpretations of the thing. That was in the second video on Heidegger we did. Uh, and he finds that they're all lacking, right? They all fail and overlook the distinction between different types of things, works and, and beings like humans and just mere things. And the second thing, right, another result of our considerations, Heidegger says, what we try to treat as the most immediate reality of the work, it's thingly substructure, right? The fact that it's, it's a thing, for Heidegger that does not belong to the work in that way at all. So, um, you know, the, the thingly substructure, right? The fact that a work of art is a thing, an object, okay? That is not the immediate reality of the work. That's not what makes it a work. And so if we try to focus on the artwork as a thing, we're overlooking that element that makes it be art and be a work. And for him, that's the essential aspect of it. That's the important aspect of it. So he says, as soon as we look for such a thingly substructure in the work, we have unwittingly taken work as equipment, to which we then also ascribe a superstructure supposed to contain its artistic quality. But the work is not a piece of equipment that is fitted out in addition with an aesthetic value that adheres to it. The work is no more anything of that kind, then the bare thing is a piece of equipment that merely lacks the specific equipmental characteristics of usefulness and being made. So this is where he 
diverges from that third interpretation, right? In many regards, Heidegger is with people like Aristotle. But where, he, where he's going to differ is, look, Aristotle, what you're talking about, your analysis of works of art as part form and part matter. The matter is the material. The form is the shape, if it's just sort of a natural object, like a piece of granite or sort of what it's fitted for. If it's a jug, it's shaped a certain way to, f to, f uh, uh, to uh, hold water, to hold liquid. If it's a, um, a sink or whatever, it's, it's shaped a certain way for a function. There's always a function. There's always a telos. There's always an end or a purpose. For Heidegger, that's a good way to analyze equipment. And that gets at this sort of equipmental characteristics of equipment. But that's not what a work of art does. It doesn't fit into that schema, right? As he puts it, the work is no more anything of that kind than the bare thing is a piece of equipment that merely lacks, you know, these, these characteristics of usefulness of being made. Right? So the work of art is not something like the, 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 the sculpture of Michelangelo, the sink over here we have on the right, and, and the block of granite, right? These are all made of stone, right? Let's just pretend that's not granite, that's marble, right? So they're all made of marble, let's say, okay? But there's a difference between the mere thing, right, which just sits there as a hunk, and it just, it's, it, 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 as, as, as Heidegger puts it, it's sort of self-subsistent, it's just there. It doesn't need to refer to anything else to be a block of granite, it just is, in a certain sense, it's bare, it's a bare, minute, bare thing, useless, okay? The sink, is matter, it's made of, let's say, you know, it's marble, probably not, maybe not real, but this is marble sink, let's say. And, uh, but it has a use, right? It's been made, it's been, it's been formed, has a purpose. But what about the work of art? Obviously it's been formed, it's been made, but is it, is it really a piece of equipment? Is that how we should understand the work, right? So for him, that's not, right? The work is, Something that, as he puts it, it allows the opening up of beings in their being, right? It allows us to see the shoes as shoes, you know, as, you know, as, they're, as they truly are, right? As, as the peasant uses them and she doesn't even notice them because they're so, you know, effective, comfortable, you know, well-crafted, whatever. They're just tools, equipment. But when we look at the work, it opens up it's the being of these shoes, right? In its being. And for Heidegger, again, this is the happening of truth. So the artwork opens up in its own way, the being of beings. This opening up, in other words, this deconcealing, in other words, the truth of beings happens in the work. In the artwork, the truth of what is has set itself to work. Art is truth setting itself to work. What is truth itself that it sometimes comes to pass as art? What is this setting itself to work? Okay, these are two questions. Again, he's not going to answer really quick. This lecture, I hate to, to bring you down, uh, but he's going to leave these hanging in a little bit. But these are the questions that we have to focus on, right? What is truth, okay? And we're going to get into that, I think, probably not in, the, in this lecture, obviously, but the next one and the following one. What is truth? What, what is the nature of truth? How does it come to pass as art? Right? Why, why does truth sometimes take this form of art? And what does it mean to set itself to work? Right? What, is, what does it mean for a work of art to set itself, or truth, to set itself to work in art? The origin of the artwork is art. This is something he said before. He says it right at the beginning of the essay, right? The artist and the artwork are sort of the origin of each other, but there's this third thing, art, and that's, they wouldn't exist without it, right? But what is art? And he says, art is real in the artwork. And he still hasn't answered what art is, and I don't think he ever is going to do this. He's, he, he, he'll, he'll admit it, right? He comes in, in the end of the uh, essay and kind of says that this needs to remain an open question, right? It's this riddle that needs to remain open or something, right? So, you know, 
don't be let down by Heidegger. Uh, you know, he, he, he aims to disappoint, right? He aims to confuse. He aims to, and, and, and I don't think he does this to be a dick, right? Not to be an obscure, uh, obscuritist. Like that's a lot of the critics of him want to make that claim, right? That Heidegger is just, he, he's just a blowhard that's just trying to sound deep and just say a bunch of crap. No, I think he's trying to get at the real depth of the issue here, right? And distinguish between, you know, these different modes of being, right? There's a difference between looking at things as just a thing, as something you use, and, and there's something special and unique about the experience that we have before a work of beautiful art. And I think that, you know, there's something to, you know, his analysis here. Okay, so let's get into it, right? So what is art? Art is real in the artwork. Okay, so we, we get a clue there. We look at Van Gogh's painting and art is there. It's real in the artwork. When the artwork is working, when it's setting the truth to work, that's art. So hence, hence we first seek the reality of the work. And so what does that consist in? Now we have to figure out what work is. If, if, if art is real in the artwork, well, what the heck does work even mean? How is work you know, a piece of work, something that's a, a work object, how is that different from any other object, piece of equipment, a clot of dirt? Artworks universally display a thingly character, albeit in a wholly distinct way. Again, this should be review. Obviously, works of art are things, but they're things that are different from other things. In fact, Sometimes we hesitate to call them by just that word thing. That seems kind of crude. In raising the question of its thingly substructure, we force the work into a preconceived framework by which we obstruct our own access to the work being of the work. Nothing can be discovered about the thingly aspect of the work so long as the pure self-subsistence of the work has not distinctly displayed itself. Okay, so some of this is review, but he's adding a little bit here. So let me let me let me comment a bit before we move on. So again, nothing can be discovered about the thingly aspect of the work. This is something new, but let's back up. So so when we look at the thingly substructure, as he puts it, when we try to find what it means to be a thing, this leads us astray. We already saw this in earlier lectures. We end up looking at art as equipment or we're not able to distinguish art from any other form of being or any other type of thing. So we, we, we weren't really getting anywhere, Heidegger says, with that approach. And ultimately, he says, we really can't discover anything about what makes a work of art a thing and what makes it different from other things if we don't focus first on this other aspect of the work of art, namely the fact that it's a work. What does that mean to be a work? As, this, as opposed to a piece of equipment, uh, which might also be a type of work, but not an artwork, or just a, a, a mere thing, like a block of a boulder or uh, a tree or something like that. Heck, even a tree you might not call a mere thing, maybe just a, a, a log or something laying down in, you know, in, in a, a storage unit. And he says, in order to really get at the... Um, the, the worst, the, the sort of the, um, sorry, nothing can be discovered. The thingly aspect of the work, as long as, da, 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 as long as the pure self subsists of the work has not distinguished its location. So we have to look at the work of art and we have to see it in its pure self subsistence. That's not very clear what he means by that. So we have to, let's, let's move on and see if he, if he uh, explains a bit. If he doesn't, I'll, I'll do my best, right? But let's see what he says here. What does he mean by letting the work display itself in its pure self-subsistence? Um, you might go back to an earlier lecture and think about the shoes. I think it was the last lecture when we are talking about the Van Gogh painting. The shoes, when they're actually being used, the equipment is in its own self-subsistence. I think that's you know, so Heidegger is saying that when you're using the shoes, you don't even notice the shoes. You're just wearing them. They're, 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 they have a purpose, a function. They're reliable. You don't really notice them until they break, until your shoelaces break, your shoes untied, when they don't have reliability. 
But when they're actually in their own self-subsistence, they kind of just blend with everything. They kind of recede into the background and they become, of your, they become a part of you almost, sort of a part of your functioning and coping with your environment. So how does the work do this? Is there a way that the works of art do this? The way that, you know, is there a similar um, self-subsistence in works, the way that there are, there is an equipment? That's the kind of question he's asking there. And, and can we get to it? How do we get to that self-subsistence? So he's asking, you know, is the work ever in itself accessible? To gain access to the work, it would be necessary to remove it from all relations to something other than itself in order to let it stand on its own for itself alone. But the artist's most peculiar intention already aims in this direction. The work is to be released by him to its pure self-subsistence. It is precisely in great art, and only such art is under consideration here, it's only precisely in great art that the artist remains inconsequential as compared with the work, almost like a passageway that destroys itself in the creative process for the work to emerge. Now, this is something that we saw to a lesser extent in Nietzsche, but I think really obviously in John Dewey, he says something similar about how great works of art, the artist is almost invisible, right? That, that, that you know, if you're a singer or you're part of a band, <clears throat> you're, you're so talented, but your talent blends as an element of the whole. There's like a form to the work of art that has a unity. And so not one part is going to be obtrusive and stick out and be distracting. And I think Heidegger is saying a similar thing here, that an artist, when he creates a work of art, he doesn't want you to be thinking about him. Oh, look, it's another Banksy. Uh, I got a, a, you know, a street art by Banksy pictured here. Look, it's another Banksy. How cool. Banksy's so cool. He's anonymous. No one knows who he is. Well, that defeats his purpose. He's anonymous. He doesn't want you to think about him. He wants you to look at his art. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of putting words in Banksy's mouth. I don't know. I've never really, I don't think I've ever really read any of his artist statements, but I know he does, you know, a lot of political stuff. So I think he's trying to get you to think about issues and, you know, the world you live in and things like this. But, you know, he's just, he's so famous as a persona and no one knows his actual identity that, he, you know, he himself has detracted from the work. And so for, you know, for Heidegger, that makes it hard for us to just to see the work in its, like, as he puts it, it's pure self-subsistence. Um, so, you know, again, it says we can't, and for, for him, we can't really discover the thingly aspect. You know, what, what is it about the work of art that makes it a thing? And what kind of thing is it that makes it different from other types of things? We can't really get to that until we get, we're able to, again, see this work itself in its pure standing in itself, right? And it's in its pure self subsistence. Once that, the, 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 the pure standing in itself of the work has clearly shown itself. But, you know, we might ask, is it ever able, is this possible? Can we ever do this? Do we ever see, you know, like for instance, do we ever see the work itself in the so-called art world, right? If we go to see a, 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 a work of art in an art museum, well, to do, you know, to do, to do this, right? To be able to see the work itself, we have to let the work stand alone, remove all context. And um, I don't know if this is going to be possible in the art museum. Heidegger is very doubtful about this. This is another, um, I think this is another place where he definitely is going to be with John Dewey. They, 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 sh they share a similar uh, concern, right? I don't know if concern is the right word, but an observation, right? That, that the work of art to truly be a work in the sense of working, you know, for Heidegger, uh, and I kind of for Dewey, right? It, it works because of its experience. Otherwise, it's just an, an art product, just an art thing. But for it to be an art work, there has to be a viewer experiencing it and getting this sort of, uh, you know, intense uh, uh, feeling and of unity and, 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 and tension for Dewey that is resolved somehow. So for Heidegger, though, it's more of a cultural thing. You know, for Dewey, that's a big aspect of it as well. But when you look at art in an art museum, it's removed from its original cultural context. And, 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 and 
not just its cultural context, but the emotion of the artist, the intent of the artist, the truth that was trying to be revealed and, and, and unconcealed, disclosed uh, in the work of art, that that has somehow passed in a certain sense, right? So do, do we really find the work in the art world? That's a big question mark. And Heidegger doesn't really leave it a question mark. He seems to say emphatically, no, we don't. We really don't. <laughs> as much as we try, we don't really find the work of the artwork in the art world, right? We don't find works there. So he writes, well then, the work themselves stand and hang in collections and exhibitions, but are they here in themselves as the works they themselves are? Or are they not rather here as objects of the art industry? Works are made available for public and private art appreciation. Official agencies assume the care and maintenance of works. Connoisseurs and critics busy themselves with them. Art dealers supply the market. Art historical study makes the works the objects of a science. Yet in all this busy activity, do we encounter the work itself? The Agena sculptures in the Munich collection, Sophocles Antigone, in the best critical edition are, as the works they are, torn out of their native sphere. However high their quality and power of impression, however good their state of preservation, however certain their interpretation, placing them in a collection has withdrawn them from their own world. But even when we make an effort to cancel or avoid such displacement of works. When, for instance, we visit the temple in Paestum at its own site, or the Bamberg Cathedral on its own square, the world of the work that stands there has perished. Right, so we can go to the Munich collection, right, and look at these beautiful Agena sculptures, right? But the, the world, the, the, the world of the Greeks, from which they were created is gone forever. So they're not gonna have the same significance that they had for the ancient Greek. And they're not gonna let truth happen in the work, the way Heidegger talks about in the Van Gogh painting, right? That the work, the way that the, the truth of the peasants choose, the, you know, the truth of the equipment, right? The being of that particular being, the essence, it's nature. What, you know, what it was, you know, when it was, what it was, right? It was so confusing, right? But yeah, <clears throat> the essence of the shoes it, are, are their use. And the work of art allowed us to see that truth. These, these sculptures from, you know, the Agena sculptures, they might have served a religious function or a symbol of civic pride to the Greeks who, who viewed them and appreciated them and the sculptors who made them. But that, 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 that historical period, that historical constellation, is no longer. And as much as we try to preserve it and reproduce it, it's a reproduction and it's not, it doesn't have that force. It doesn't have that working of truth or setting up of a world uh, that we're gonna talk more about in the next lecture, okay? So it's sort of, you know, um, it would, it, you know, when we relocate a work of art, it withdraws it from the world, right? From the world from which it was created, right? The world of the ancient Greek, the world of the peasant woman, you know, whatever it, whatever it is, okay? Again, this is very similar to, to Nietzsche, right? Uh, uh, he doesn't really, I think, talk so much about the separation as so much the, you know, to understand art, you really have to understand the culture from which it, it, it originated and their sort of, their view of life. And in fact, for Nietzsche, art reveals a culture to us. It gives, it's sort of a mirror or a reflection of a worldview, the way that a culture sees the world. And for Dewey, he makes a similar point to Heidegger is that, you know, like, you know, he was in Dewey, the Dewey lectures, and, and we were talking about his book, The Art is Experience, uh, you know, in the first chapter, he uses the Parthenon, the Greek Parthenon is appreciated as a, as a beautiful work of art, uh, but we're never really gonna appreciate it really fully. We, it doesn't work 
the way that it worked for the Greeks who actually went to the Parthenon and used it, as, you know, as the center of civic duties and, you know, to govern the city and pride and, and to celebrate, you know, Athenian democracy, that's lost and we, we can never get it back, right? You know, so Heidegger, you know, he says this, that what he calls world withdrawal, right? Taking these, these, these works from their world and world decay, the fact that these worlds are gone, they're lost, you know, that can't be reversed, right? They're not coming back. So he says, world withdrawal and world decay can never be undone. The works are no longer the same as they once were. It is they themselves to be sure that we encounter there, but they themselves are gone by. As bygone works, they stand over against us in the realm of tradition and conservation. Henceforth, they remain merely such objects. Their standing before us is still indeed a consequence of, but no longer the same as, their former self-subsistence. This self-subsistence has fled from them. The whole art industry, even if it carried to the extreme and exercised in every way for the sake of works themselves, extends only to the object being of the works. But this does not constitute their work being, okay? So in the art world, we're confronted with works as objects, their object being, uh, not their work being. They no longer work, right? They're, they're self-subsistence, right? The Greek temple was just a temple and it didn't have to be impressive as a work of art. It was like, dude, we gotta go to the temple to worship the gods. And, and, and yeah, of course it's beautiful, it has to be. Like, we're proud of that. But yeah, you know, you, you, you sort of let it, take a hold of you right you, you can imagine maybe the early christians when they were going to these beautiful cathedrals on sunday and and hearing the sermon about you know the, the afterlife and the other you know god and all these you know otherworldly things that the beauty of the cathedral was able to transport them into the other world in a certain sense to get them as close as they could viscerally into the presence of that divineness, right? But we go see the cathedral and just say, oh, that's a very nice uh, mural. That's a really pretty, uh, uh, look at the artwork, look at the craftsmanship. And that's nice and fine, that's good, but that's, 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 that's an object. Now it's just an object. It's not a work being. Uh, this is very similar, you could say, to the distinction that John Dewey draws between art products an art work, right? An art product is just the thing. The art work is, well, it's the thing in its relation to its audience and the experience that we get. That's the work. That's, and, and, and again, similar thing, but, but for Heidegger, he ties it in deeply to truth. And I think that's something quite different, right? That, that, that art lets truth, right? Lets the being of the thing be in a certain sense and his you know, kind of difficult uh, way of expressing himself. So, um, again, the fact that these works are preserved or honored or collected, he thinks, and this is also very similar to Dewey, it's a consequence of their former standing in themselves. The fact that they actually were, they were these forceful, striking objects, okay? Um, but really, as far as the art industry is concerned, you know, he's very much with Dewey that the art industry, works of art in a museum, here we see Michelangelo's David, it's no longer in its original home, right? Originally, Michelangelo's David was, was in front of the, the, the courthouse. It was in front of City Hall. It was a sign of civic pride. You know, David, obviously, that's the biblical reference. David facing up to Goliath, you know, with this sort of look in his face. You don't scare me, you big giant. This was a sign of the, you know, Florence standing alone, surrounded by the, you know, the church and the Romans and, you know, and, and being able to sort of stand on their own against all these forces and still be an independent republic. This work had that significance, but this building that it's in now, the building actually was built around David. They moved the sculpture here and they built the structure around the object. That's about as removed. Now it's just, it's, it's, it's completely just a piece that is, you know, it's obviously admired and set aside, but it's not a work anymore, right? Uh, for, for Heider, he says the work as a work belongs uniquely 
within what he calls the region that it itself opens up, right? So, you know, the civic pride that the Florentine citizens got when they walked by the statue of David said, hey, look at how great our artist is. Look how wonderful Michelangelo is. What a great artist. We're so proud of him. But look at us. Look how proud we are as a city that we can stand in as a republic. Now, of course, they could have been lying to themselves or whatever. And I mean, it wasn't a perfect utopia, right? There's a lot of flaws with the Florentine system. Uh, you know, ultimately, there's a lot of corruption and all that. You, you can, you can, you know, make your gripes, okay? But it, it had a certain effect. It had a certain power, a certain potency, and it's lost that potency. It's not that it's not. It's not that it's not a wonderful work of art with made with great skill and craftsmanship, but it's no longer in, as Heidegger puts it, the region that it itself opens up. So where does the work belong? And as he puts it, he says the work belongs as a work uniquely within the realm that is opened up by itself for the work being of the work is present in and only in such an opening we say that in the work there was a happening of truth at work the reference to van gogh's picture tried to point to this happening and again you can review the last lecture to talk to sort of get more if you didn't get that the last time go and review it, right? The, the Van Gogh painting he's arguing is letting us see how the shoes are in truth, right? You know, how, how the, you know, how the, the, pe the peasant, they, they let us enter into the world of the peasant woman who wears them, right? So in the work, according to him, the happening of, the happening of truth is at work. So we're going to have to end the video here on this, this quote. Uh, we're already getting over for time here. I'm trying to keep these videos under 35 minutes, and we're already over 40. So I better just end it here. <clears throat> but this is where he's turning to now, right? So he's, we're now, we're now we're asking the question of the truth with a view to the work, right? What is it in the work, right? What does it mean that there's a happening of truth there at work, right? He says, so in order to become more familiar with what this question involves, we have to make more visible once more the happening of truth in the work. And for this attempt, he's going to look at a different piece of art, this time something that you can't, you cannot rank as representational art, right? Like Van Gogh's shoes here, obviously a representational art. You could say, well, that's just a picture of his shoes. He's just painting his shoes. Well, in the next lecture, he's going to analyze a Greek temple and he's going to show how a Greek temple is also as a work of art, something that is, is establishing truth or in which truth happens and in which truth is at work. Oh, but again, I'm just rambling on and on. You need to shut up. The video is going over way too long. Uh, but anyways, I think we'll be able to wrap this up in probably three or four more videos. But you know how I go. This, this series might go on for eight or nine videos for, for, for all we know. But I hope you're getting a lot out of this. Thanks for sticking around till the end of this video. And I hope to see you guys on the other side. Cheers.